Let's turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, beginning tonight with verse 63. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. In the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verse 32, Jesus had predicted to his disciples that he would be mocked, spitefully entreated, and spit upon. This is the beginning of the fulfillment of that prophecy of Jesus, that whole sad affair. It says they smote him. They mocked him. When on the day of Pentecost, Peter had preached that message to the assembled crowd on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When he came to the point in the message where he was talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, he declared, and you, according to God's predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge, with your wicked hands have crucified and slain. In other words, the death of Jesus Christ was not some mistake. It wasn't man being carried away in a mob psychology and thwarting or bending the purposes or plans of God. But it was the purpose of God that his son should die for our sins. He sent him to the world for that purpose. And thus, it was a part of God's plan according to his predeterminate counsels, according to his foreknowledge. God knew it the whole time. Because God knew it, in the next few moments, the next few hours, several prophecies from the Old Testament are to be filled, fulfilled. Scores of Old Testament prophecies are now going to be coming to pass in Jesus being despised and rejected, being mocked, being smitten, being scourged, being crucified, being placed in the tomb of a wealthy man, rising again, all of these things are the fulfillment of scores of prophecies out of the Old Testament. So. All of a sudden, the whole prophetic scheme is going to start popping one after another. In Zechariah, he declared, Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. And so they smote him. Psalm 69, which is a recognized what is called messianic psalm. That is, a psalm that is prophesying of the Messiah. In that 69th psalm, there are the words, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up and the reproaches of them that reproached thee have fallen upon me. Now you remember that when Jesus came to the temple and he saw the crass commercialism, he saw how that they had taken the things of God and used them for their own personal gain and profit how they were taking advantage of the people who were seeking to worship God 
and making merchandise out of them, and he couldn't handle it. He was angry. He made a scourge, and he began to overturn the tables of the money changers, driving out the cattle and the sheep and the people that had committed this horrible sacrilege. And it said, and then they remembered the scripture which saith, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And they realized that here is the one, the Messiah of whom the scripture was speaking. But that same psalm goes on to say, I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me. And I was the song of the drunkards. And so they mocked him. Songs of the drunkards. He became a proverb. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, it declares, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. And so the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. Here he was being held, being mocked, being smitten, and when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? So part of the whole mocking and abusing of Jesus, putting on the blindfold, and then beginning to hit him. Our bodies are marvelously designed by God. And God has built in what we call reflex actions. As a child, you all experimented with the reflex actions, swinging your hand at a friend and watching him blink, reflex, you know, reflex action in blinking. Your eyes see an object coming and, and they in a reflex action, well, the lids will close to protect the pupil of the eye from damage. There are other types of reflex actions. We have great peripheral type of vision, some more than others. And when you see a blow coming, there is a certain reflex action that flows with the blow so that as you see the blow coming, you instinctively reflex action type sort of pull back and in the pulling back with the blow, it cushions the blow. It isn't nearly as damaging. Every quarterback knows what the phrase blindsided means. You see the quarterbacks out there and you see them after they release the pass and then these big, gigantic linemen take a shot at the quarterback. And you wonder how in the world do they ever get up after taking a shot like that? But they bounce right back up and they're ready to, you know, throw the ball again. Because as you see the object coming, instinctively, you react and you, you relax and you, you, you move with it. You don't stand rigid, but you move with it to cushion the blow. And when you get injured is when the guy hits you, blindsides you, you don't see him coming, that's when you get hurt. Because you're not prepared for it. You're not moving with it. You're not taking the reflex actions necessary to cushion it. Now in blindfolding Jesus, 
and then beginning to hit him. He can't see the blow coming, and thus he takes the full force of the blow. The prophecy of Isaiah that we read tonight concerning Jesus said that they so battered his face that he couldn't be recognized as a human being. That was because he was blindfolded, was not able to faint with the blows, and thus took the full force of the blows until his face was so marred that you couldn't recognize him as, as a human being. Jesus was receiving this brutal beating as they were mocking him and saying, hey man, prophesy, who was it that just hit you? And it says many other things blasphemously spake they against him. This was the heyday for Satan, for the men of sin. Man was taking out his anger against God. Man was seeking to destroy God. Verse 66, and as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priest and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? So early in the morning, as the day began to dawn, they took him from the house of Annas, unto the house of Caiaphas, where the religious body known as the Sanhedrin gathered together to pass judgment on him. Now, this trial was completely illegal by Jewish law. The Sanhedrin, when they met for trial, were to meet in one of the rooms of the temple. But we are told in the other Gospels that they were meeting at the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. They had two issues that they wanted to resolve, two questions. The first one, are you the Messiah? And then the second one, are you the Son of God? These were the two questions that were asked. Vital questions. To the first question, are you the Messiah? And the word Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. Jesus said, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And then he said, and if I also ask you a question, you will not answer me or let me go. So you asked the question, but if I answered, you wouldn't believe me anyhow. And if I ask you a question for clarification, you won't answer me. When Jesus was cleansing the temple from their merchandising, they came to Jesus and they said, by what authority do you do these things and who gave you the authority? Jesus said, I'll ask you a question, and you answer my question, I'll answer yours. The baptism of John 
Was it of God or was it of man? And they held a quick council and they said, well, if we say it's of man, the people will get angry and stone us because they think John was a prophet. But if we say it was of God, then he's going to nail us and say, well, why didn't you believe John? So they said, we can't answer your question. <laughs> and Jesus said, so I don't answer yours. <laughs> it was, he's referring back to that here. If I ask you a question, you won't answer me. He had asked them another question. He said, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said, well, he's the son of David. He said, how is it then that David called him Lord? Now, you'd have to know the culture, the, the Mideast, to understand that completely. It's a patriarch type of a society, and no father would ever call his son Lord. The father was Lord as long as he lived. He ruled. And yet David called the Messiah Lord. In Psalm 110, and Jehovah said unto my Lord, and David said he was my Lord, my Adonai. And they couldn't answer Jesus the question. So Jesus said, in response to the question, are you the Messiah? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer me. But then Jesus went ahead and answered them. For he said, Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Now go back to the psalm where the question of David calling the Messiah Lord. And that first verse, the whole verse is this. Jehovah said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. When Jesus said, you're not going to see me from henceforth until you see me sitting there at the right hand. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Jesus was declaring very plainly, I am the Messiah. Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Hereafter, I'm going to be sitting at the right hand of the power of God. And so it was a very clear and plain declaration to them. The answer to their first question, are you the Messiah? A few months earlier at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus was with his disciples and he said, who do people think I am? And one of the disciples heard, said, well, I heard someone say they thought you were John the Baptist. You'd come back from the dead. Another said, I heard someone say they thought you were Elijah. Another one said, well, I heard someone say they thought maybe you were Jeremiah or the other prophet. Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. 
For flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. The two questions that they are asking, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? This is what Peter confessed. Thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Just a week or so prior to this, when Jesus came to Bethany at the urgent request of Mary and Martha because of their brother Lazarus being so sick, by the time Jesus got to Bethany, Lazarus was dead and had been buried. Martha came out of the city down the road towards Jericho when Jesus and his disciples came into sight. She came running to meet him. And when she met him, she said, Lord, if you would only have been here, my brother would not have died. It was saying, Lord, you're too late. What took you so long? Why didn't you get here sooner? Lord, if you would only have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, Martha, your brother will live again. She said, oh, yes, Lord, I know in the last day the great resurrection. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And if you live and believe in me, you will never die. Martha, do you believe this? I would have to say that the statement of Jesus is probably the most radical statement made by any person in history. When a man would stand before you and say, I am the resurrection and the life, if you believe in me, though you were dead, yet you will live, and if you live and believe in me, you will never die. That's radical. And then to say, do you believe this? You see, immediately, it divides all men into two categories those who do believe that and those who do not. You say, well, I partly believe it. No, sorry, it doesn't work. You either believe it or you don't believe it. You see, it divides men into two categories, those who have a hope of eternal life those who have no hope of life after death. Martha, do you believe it? She said, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Her confession. I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Same confession of Peter. Early in the ministry of Christ, it's recorded, I think, back in about the oh, fourth chapter or so. It says that when the demons faced him, they cried, saying, We know who you are. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. The question, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? The demons affirmed that he was. We know you. We know who you are. You're the Messiah, the Son of God. When Jesus was passing through Samaria and he met the woman at the well, and when she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet, and our fathers say that we are to worship God in this mountain, and you say we have to worship him in Jerusalem. Where can I find God? And Jesus said, God is a spirit, 
and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. She said, I know that when the Messiah comes, he's going to teach us all things. And Jesus said, woman, I who speak unto thee am he. Looking for the Messiah? <laughs> You're talking to him, honey. <laughs> there was a man who was born blind, and Jesus came to him, and he spit on the ground and made some mud, and then he rubbed it in the guy's eyes, and he said, now go down to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes. And the fellow made his way down to the pool of Siloam. And he washed his eyes out. And when he did, he could see. And he started broadcasting around. I can see. I can see. You know, hold up your fingers. I'll count them for you. I can see. And... and People knew that he was born blind. And so the Pharisees were faced with this miracle and, and too many people knew about it. They couldn't hush it up and so they decided to examine the thing out and, and they thought, well, maybe he wasn't blind. And so they asked the parents, is this your son? Yes. Was he blind? Yeah, he was blind. How can he see? We don't know. They, they knew that already had been determined that if anybody confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, they'd throw him out of the synagogue, and so they were fearful. They said, look, he's of age, ask him. So they said, are, are, were you really blind? He says, yes, I was blind. How can you see? Well, fellow put some mud in my eyes and told me to wash and, and, and I did and now I can see. Well, they said, we, we don't know this fellow, who he's from, anything about him, so you just praise God, you know. And the fellow said, hey, here's something very amazing, you know. You don't know where he's from? And yet he can open the eyes of the blind? You ever thought he might be the Messiah? He said, hey, fellow, you were born in sin. You're going to instruct us? Out of the synagogue, out, you know, and they kicked him out. And when Jesus heard that the fellow had been kicked out of the synagogue, he sought for him, he looked for him, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of God? And the fellow said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe? And Jesus said, I am he. Jesus had confessed that he was the Messiah. He had confessed that he was the Son of God. Now he's on trial. And these are the two questions that are being asked. Are you the Messiah? To that he answered, Next time you see me, fellas, <laughs> I'll be sitting at the right hand of the power on high, the power of God on high. The fulfillment of that Psalm 110, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So when Jesus said this, they knew exactly that he had answered that question, are you the Messiah, in the affirmative. So immediately they all jumped on it. Not just one cross-examination. Now, everyone jumped into the thing, verse 70. Then they all said, are you then the Son of God? And Jesus said, You say that I am. A better translation would probably be, you said it. <laughs> Are you?
Are you then the Son of God? You said it. At that point, the high priest, Caiaphas, ripped his robes, which was a symbolic sign of the consternation, total consternation, of the high priest hearing words of blasphemy. For Jesus to claim to be the Son of God. And so they said, Why do we need any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. We don't need to get any more witnesses or any further witnesses. He, he's condemned himself. He has claimed to be the Son of God. They understood very clearly what Jesus was saying. There are some today that seek to argue concerning Jesus Christ, and they say that he never claimed to be the Son of God, and he never claimed to be the Messiah. That is, he never once said, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. They say that Jesus never did make that claim. These people who make that claim are not really reading the scriptures. When Jesus said to the blind man who was healed, do you believe the Son of God? He said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe? Jesus said, I am he. No, he didn't say, I am the Son of God. He just said, I am he. I mean, but the question was, who is the Son of God? When Jesus spoke to the woman of Samaria, and she said, I know when the Messiah comes, he's going to teach us all things. He said, woman, I that speak unto thee am he. Now hear. When they say, are you the Messiah? He said, if I would answer you, you wouldn't believe me. If I'd ask you a question, you wouldn't answer me. But, you want the answer? When I leave here, I'm going to be sitting at the right hand of the power of God. That's the answer. It's in Psalm 110, verse 1, where Jehovah said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Oh, then are you the Son of God? You said it. And so we have heard, they said, from his own mouth. These two questions are pivotal, are pivotal and are important. You see, these are, this is the issue. Is Jesus Christ the Messiah? Is Jesus Christ the Son of God? What do you believe? These are the pivotal questions upon which your eternal destiny is resting. When they asked these two questions, they were asking the most important questions of all. They had honed the thing down. They had come down, and it all comes down to this. Are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? And those are questions for which we tonight need to be very deeply concerned. Is he the Messiah? Is he the Son of God? With Martha, I must confess, yes, I believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. Many years later, John wrote his gospel. And as John wrote his gospel, 
towards the end of the gospel, he said, and many other things Jesus did which we did not write about. But these things we have written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing have life in his name. That's what it's all about. This whole record was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing in that, might have eternal life. And your answer to these questions determines your eternal destiny. Serious questions indeed. Shall we pray? O oh Lord, we are convinced and do believe that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. He is the Son of God who was given that we, by believing in him, would not perish but have everlasting life. And Lord, we remember how when, P when Stephen was being stoned, as he was dying, he cried out, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the power of God. Lord, we thank you that you are there, ever making intercession for us who have come to believe that you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. Lord, I pray for those tonight who have had doubts, who have had questions, living in uncertainty, hungering after God, but yet not being able to find. May they come to Jesus Christ this night find God. In his name we pray.